This is Hubwonk. I'm Joe Silvaggi. Welcome to Hubwonk, a podcast of Pioneer Institute, a think tank in Boston. Americans remain divided on how best to address large, measurable differences in outcomes amongst racial groups. The emergent view of writers such as Boston University professor Ibram X. Kendi is that racial differences in wealth, education, incarceration rates, and health point to systemic racism as the cause. Adherents of this view continue that the remedies for racism's stubborn systemic influence are public policy choices that strive for equity or equal racial group outcomes to remediate racism's historically intractable scourge. But critics of this viewpoint have questioned the wisdom of ascribing racial group characteristics to all individuals of a shared race and further challenge policy solutions that identify racism as a monocausal reason for complex social and economic phenomena. Perhaps as important, critics of anti-racism point to the conflicts of interest for a movement that claims to be combating racism while also using the presence of ubiquitous racism to justify its power. Are there alternatives to the anti-racism framework that acknowledge the challenges of historical discrimination while placing the power for complex reform measures in a narrative of empowerment for all Americans, regardless of race. My guest today is Associate Professor of Rhetoric at York College of Pennsylvania, President and Co-Founder of Free Blank Thought, and Senior Fellow at the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, Dr. Eric Smith. Professor Smith's most recent book entitled, A Critique of Anti-Racism in Rhetoric and Composition, The Semblance of Empowerment, challenges the current framework and vocabulary of anti-racism by pointing to the simplification of arguing that Black Americans share a common experience and that the solution for improving their condition lies beyond their control. He will share with us the way in which the framing of the anti-racist narrative serves to disempower racial minorities who embrace it by taking away the role of individual agency and placing the responsibility for improvement with others. We will also discuss the professional repercussions of challenging the dominant anti-racism orthodoxy in today's academic environment. When I return, I'll be joined by author and associate professor, Dr. Eric Smith. Okay, we're back. This is Hubwonk. I'm Joe Silvaggi, and I'm now pleased to be joined by associate professor of rhetoric at your College of Pennsylvania, president and co-founder of Free Black Thought, a visiting scholar for the Cato Institute, and Senior Fellow at the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, Dr. Eric Smith. Welcome to Hubwonk, Professor Smith. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm very uh, excited to uh, have this discussion with you because I I will admit uh, from the outset that I didn't really know your name uh, uh, broadly. I hadn't encountered your work. Uh, And then suddenly you seem to be everywhere. I've seen you... uh, uh, first came aware of you at a, a Cato Institute uh, event, but then uh, discovered uh, your most recent work, uh, which I found fascinating, uh, entitled A Critique of Anti-Racism in Rhetoric and Composition. Uh, you know, you, you, what you do is you're, um, uh, I'll, I'll let you share with our listeners what that means, but you are a PhD in rhetoric, uh, which uh, from my layperson point of view is a, it means you're an expert in words, in communication, even in persuasion. So I think you're well suited to deal with what I think is a very thorny issue of how to deal with race in in modern society, particularly in academia, but in sort of uh, amongst those people who are thought leaders or elite in our our, uh, uh, society. So let's start with the, at the very, very beginning, uh, a little bit about you. Um, What does an expert in rhetoric know? What, tell us about your uh, expertise. Well, an expert in rhetoric typically, traditionally, abides by um, what Aristotle called uh, rhetoric, which is the ability in any given situation to discern the available means of persuasion. Uh, so what does that mean? It means several things. Uh, knowing your audience, uh, knowing the attitudes, values, and beliefs of your audience so you can speak or write accordingly. Um, understanding context. Um, how does the time and place, as well as the audience, affect what you're going to say, right? Um, what you say on Tuesday uh, may be said quite differently on Wednesday based on the given circumstances. Same message, different wording, right? Um, that's basically the crux of, um, of rhetoric. Um, there are rhetorical appeals. Uh, when do you use emotion? When do you rely on 
uh, logic and reason? When do you rely on credibility? How do you build credibility uh, when you don't have any through words alone? Right. Uh, those are things uh, you can talk about, too. It's also about interpretation. How do we rhetorically analyze something? How can we tell if somebody's using uh, tactics on us? Right. Um, how do we notice logical fallacies, psychological fallacies, material fallacies? Um, ultimately, it's about uh, discourse. And when I say discourse, I don't just mean conversation. I mean the values, attitudes, beliefs, preferences, uh, that a given community has. Now, communities can overlap, but basically a discourse can be considered distinct. So those are all the things that come to mind immediately when you ask me that question. Right. Well, no, I know you you, you definitely understand the, the topic, I, I, you know, but the ancient Greeks uh, have something to teach us. I, I think uh, my, um, my knowledge is that we break it down even further into sort of the Pathos, logos, and ethos of a, of a uh, way of speaking. There's all kinds of elements, all things hidden in our in our words and the way we communicate. Um, so uh, that makes you well qualified to to uh, weigh in on uh, what you've written extensively. I'm, I made reference to your book about anti-racism or critique of anti-racism. So again, for the benefit of our, our listeners, let's weigh in a little bit on uh, what these terms. Let's define the term, the the log logos of these terms. Uh, uh, at the very least, the uh, what is the modern anti-racist movement uh, it, 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 that you reference in your book? Um, well, first I'll say it's distinct from the uh, 1960s civil rights-based idea of anti-racism and being against racism. Um, anti-racism contemporarily abides by a lot of uh, what's called critical social theory um, or critical social justice more specifically. And what that does is paint the world as us versus them, uh, oppressor versus oppressed, right? And anti-racism is about that oppressed group resting um, rights and equality from the oppressors. That's the idea anyway. Now you can say, wait a minute, uh, let's define oppressed because you seem okay with, to me, you know? <laughs> Um, we can say that, and that's part of the um, problem with it. But ultimately, um, what a minority group in an anti-racist framework is, is um, they all abide, people in that group abide by group consciousness. And what that means is, um, A, um, your in-group can do no wrong, all right? The out-group is the enemy. All your in-group's problems are because of the out-group, right? And you control certain information in that uh, group, in your in-group, so that there's no real viewpoint diversity. There are only certain viewpoints that are circulated throughout to get this idea that there's one way to look at the world. Um, so that's basically what it is. It's very divisive, and that is very us against them situation, where in the 60s, it was let us join you, right? Uh, let us be a part of this American experiment. And now it's you're the bad guy, I'm the good guy. Let's fight. So, so we're making generalizations. We're putting people into to groups, and those groups are defined by race. So that essentially everyone in one race or another race shares similar oppression or privilege. Uh, and there's a sort of zero sum game for power. And that, as you say, power needs to be wrested from one group in order to get from the other. So it's a, a confrontational. I, I dare say almost like a Marxist view. Like one yeah. of the views of that uh, you know, socialism or Marxism doesn't really get a foothold here in the US is that we all kind of consider ourselves middle class. There's no us and them. There's no bourgeois and proletariat. We're all sort of in there swinging. What we've tried to do then now, it seems, is uh, latch onto immutable characteristics we call race uh, and, and say, look, if you're in this group, you're, you share a common experience. If you're in that group, you share a common ex um, experience. Uh, you're, in reading your book, you see this narrative not just as wrong, but potentially profoundly disempowering. In what way would, let's say, this, this narrative disempower uh, a group that, in theory, it's trying to help? Um, well, you're teaching learned helplessness. You're teaching that the world is against you, right? You're teaching that these uh, values like hard work, self-reliance, punctuality, scientific method, these things are inherently oppressive because they... Uh, are, are, are understood as coming from Eurocentric origins. Therefore, uh, the 
colonists, right? The uh, the imperialists, the uh, the conquerors, right? So you're thinking you're, you're you're being told that everything that upholds society is inherently oppressive to you, right? So there's this uh, kind of uh, learned helplessness going on, uh, this victimology that can only disempower, right? Um, how I empower my students and you know um, anybody who I can possibly empower is to let them know that there are ways to gather agency. Um, there are ways to develop an internal locus of control. Um, and there are ways to get to where you want to get. And you know, the society isn't against you, right? Uh, you make a determination and you follow that determination to the best of your ability. So uh, anti-racism, especially in education, is inherently disempowering. And we can talk about why it's disempowering and, and how that Marxist thought comes into play as well, but it's all, it's all there. Uh, I was interested, again, I, I don't know whether it was in your book that you mentioned or some work that, again, I, I've tried to read all I could find, but in a sense, when you became activated, you, you had been someone who, as you say, understood uh, uh, a movement against racism. Who wouldn't want to fight racism? Uh, even if you were a member of, let's say, uh, uh, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion type of movement within an uh, organization, within a university. So that it was among your tasks to make sure that everyone was being treated fairly, as you say. Um, but I, I think it was a moment of uh, where uh, maybe an inflection point in your life where you saw a, um, a work where someone was talking about the imposition of proper grammar, English grammar, uh, imposing those standards on Black students was somehow inherently racist. I don't know if this was the moment you said, wait a minute, hold my beer, this, this is bad. Um, but yeah. to me, you know, not just that that is a problem in and of itself to expect proper English grammar for um, elite students, but that, um, that that's sort of a, a representative of a larger framework. You mentioned all kinds of other good attributes along with proper grammar, like punctuality, hard work, all these kinds of things. Um, which empower an individual, a student. If you speak well, you're going to do better. Um, share with our listeners uh, how that moment, you know, dawned on you that, in a sense, um, this anti-racist movement could potentially be saying to uh, black students, you know, stick with um, colloquial uh, improper grammar because uh, you got to be you. So share with our listeners uh, what what that's all about. Yes, the you got to be you movement um, is being presented as antithetical to, you know, traditional uh, education, and it doesn't have to be. Um, the, the speech that sparked all this um, was given at a keynote conference in my field of rhetorical studies. And yes, the argument was that teaching standard English to students of color, especially Black students, was inherently racist. Even the mere presence of uh, white professors and a predominantly white classroom is a problem. Um, that needs to be discussed. This is all very um, disempowering, um, in, in, in my opinion. And I, that was the day when I realized, okay, um, this is this this niche that I've seen throughout my career has suddenly broadened into uh, the field at large, and um, I, I want to do something. Um, when I mentioned, you know, if. Uh, not teaching standard English or considering standard English as inherently racist was good for our students. I got a backlash that was also telling. Um, I realized that you know something had to be done to actually give these students the tools they need to be happy and successful in society. And that's where the antithesis comes in. The person who was giving this speech and various other people in my field um, their goal is less about rhetorical education and more about social transformation. And that's kind of where the Marxism comes into play, the critical theory and critical pedagogy, the us versus them kind of situation. So when you're an educator, what you're supposed to be doing is giving people the tools to go out into the world and be happy and successful and fulfilled, right? Um, uh, an upstanding contributor to society, right? These are the things we want to uh, instill in our students, uh, how to think critically and things like that for the world in which we're, we're, you know, our students are going into. So 
if that's your job, but you want to social socially change society, you're you know you're you're, you're contradicting yourself. You, the person who gave the speech um, later on would say that you know if I teach these students things like standard English and how to succeed in this world, I'm perpetuating this world, and I don't like this world. <laughs> you know, so I, I'm doing social transformation as this justice and injustice um, by uh, teaching these students that you know uh, any kind of dialect would do in any situation. Right. And, and and that doesn't match what education is supposed to be. So that's a that's a really big problem for me because these students' success is the teacher's failure, you know, in a sense, in a very real sense. Right. I, I can't I can't teach these students what they need to know. They'll 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 perpetuate the status quo. I don't like the status quo. Right. So there's that disconnect there as well. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, a profound point because I think again, the, if if I perceive the the value of education myself, it's to tr transcend ourselves so that we can speak across cultures, across time, you know, across yes. sex, everything like that, so that ultimately we liberate ourselves from our condition, and our individual condition, so that we become universalizing understanding and knowledge and communication. Um, this would do the opposite. It, it sort of, in a sense, con constrain people to the lot of life they were born to. So if it was poverty or a particular ethnic group, uh, by leaving them to the local dialect or whatever you know um, way of communicating, uh, you, in a sense, condemn them to a life uh, to remain in that group. A, not to be able to communicate with other groups, and B, um, no one can communicate with them, right? So you, you deliberately isolate your students in this way. Yeah, um, and, and I can I can say that you know if somebody were to speak a you know um, a dialect of English that isn't standard, people who speak standard English you know can understand them to a degree. Um, there's more to it than that. Um, there's more than just the logos. There's the ethos and pathos. Humans. You know, um, they react to emotion. They react to the clout and credibility of the person talking, and a dialect can, you know, instill both those things. The problem comes when we, you know, look at this as a value judgment, right? If this is the standardized, that means your dialect is wrong. No, not necessarily. Um, it, it means that you want to be as persuasive as possible. And you're going to use a dialect that you think will help you do that to the best of your ability, right? But in, instead, what's being taught to these students is that, well, as you said earlier, you be you, right? Instead of I want to persuade this audience, it's I am fill in the blank, hear me roar, right? And I'm going to speak my home dialect to show you that I like being me, right? That's what the uh, that's that's what that's how it's being sold to the students. Well, I can like being me and still have various dialects at my disposal. You know, um, they're not mutually exclusive. Right, very powerfully, you use the example to sort of take the issue of talking about uh, uh, Spaniards going to Catalan, uh, uh, yeah, speak in, uh, so that they had rather than seeing themselves as um, an oppressed minority, there were Sp Spanish speaking students in in, in a Catalan speaking. Um, community at the end, they can speak both Spanish and Catalan or Catalan or whatever. I, I forget the word that you use, but they yeah. in a sense inherited some power to be able to both speak one language and the other, and be able to turn it on and off. In a sense, blend their language. You, I think you use the term code meshing, or maybe this is a universal term where you can color proper language with, as you say, the pathos uh, of of a community um, uh, and communicate and um, express yourself. You're, you're communicating clear ideas, but coloring it with your local, your personal experience, giving you extra power, not less power or separated power. Do I have it about right? I, you know, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. Yes, yes, you have it about right. Um, in, in linguistics, uh, social linguistics, things like that, there's a difference between uh, language anonymity and language authenticity. Um, language authenticity is when somebody sees language as their identity, right? Um, there are people, prominent people in my field who say you can't separate language from identity. They're one and the same. So if you, if you speak a 
or write in a different dialect than the one you were raised with, you're not being yourself, right? That's the idea. Then there's language anonymity, which sees language as a tool. You know, um, I, I have other ways of expressing my identity. I'm going to use language as a tool to communicate as clearly as possible to somebody to persuade to the best of my ability, somebody or somebody's or, or, or something like that. Um, I am a big fan of the anonymity and not the authenticity, right? And if people want to embrace the authenticity thing, fine, that's fantastic. It's a free country, but to demand that other people abide by it as well and call them inauthentic if they don't do that, that's the problem. That would be, again, I hope I'm not offending anybody, uh, discouraging people from speaking white or sounding white is, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, some sort of moral suasion or, or some sort of effort to stifle someone who's, as you say, uh, communicating in a way that is, let's say, standard or, or mm -hmm. adequately convey their uh, ethnic origin. Right, right, right. This is all anti-racism, contemporary anti-racism is besides the Marxist influences and things like that, which we can talk about, it's an esteem movement. You know, you know it, it, it's about uh, group dignity, uh, giving dignity to a group of people that are perceived as not having any, right? Um, so it's not about pragmatism anymore. The pragmatic take is, I'm going to speak or write in this way. I'm going to use these references. I'm going to use this discourse to persuade this audience to the best of my ability. That's the pragmatic way. The esteem-based way is I'm going to be myself. And if they don't like it, fine. Well, you can be yourself and speak, you know, um, and translate what you're saying, if you will, um, into a dialect that will be more familiar right, with the audience that you're speaking to, whether it's one person or a group. Is this all about um, pragmatism? There's no pragmatism in contemporary anti-racism. It's all about um, idealism. It's all about feelings. It's all about esteem. All right. So this, you know, we talk about almost ancient times, not that long ago, but, you know, it isn't that long ago. I mean, it seems like this uh, sort of anti-racism movement has been relatively recent. It's sort of like wildfire, uh, fairly recent. I, I'll just say anecdotally, I've I've uh, friends who have kids in, in school. They were in grammar school maybe ten years ago, and they they're very proud to you know the progressive uh, sorts, and they they were proud to say that their friends had brought home um, kids that they'd been going to school with for months. They finally came home and they realized some of their friends were black or Asian or something like that, and they said, you know, my kid's so enlightened, he he never even mentioned this, and and I was incredulous. Mm -hmm. I'm like tall or short or left-handed, he, he might notice, but he doesn't notice race. Those same people, 10 years later, now they're next week going to be graduating from Harvard, those same mm -hmm. kids are separate graduation events because the experience of Harvard is completely different for one group versus another. So we've gone from being essentially post-racial deliberately and proudly to you know what effectively is, is, is sort of a race essentialism, which is saying, the experience of life is fundamentally different for, by virtue of one's race. It, 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 it is, it, did it just happen in my universe so quickly or did, is, is it, you know, did you see the same sort of flip in the, in, in the last decade? Yeah, I've seen the same flip in the last decade and it caught me off guard too. Um, and I told you earlier about the speech in 2019 that sparked uh, this whole thing or my involvement in this whole thing. Anyway, yes, it's race essentialism, which is inherently nonsensical, right? Um, it is it, a demonization of individualism in, in, in a real sense. I think individualism is kind of the key uh, to all of this, um, but we can we can talk about that a a, a little bit later. Uh, the uh, the idea that I experience the world differently because of my skin color, okay. Every individual experiences the world differently, for one thing. Secondly, just because I am Black doesn't mean I have the same experience as the other Black guy over there, right? We're two different people. Um, just because he gets offended at a statement doesn't mean I find it offensive, right? We are two very different people. So race essentialism, you know, it, it, it kind of denies all those things. It's, it's unrealistic in a sense. But you're doing this, why? Because race essentialism is the only way to do an us versus them. 
right? You know, uh, if everybody's an individual, you can't do that. You know, so you need the us versus them construction in order to you know, successfully transform society into what you want it to be. That's the Marxist idea. Anyway, the cultural Marxism going on within all of this. Right. So. So, yeah, that's uh, that's the crux of it. Well, I, I again, I stumbled across you. It was a Cato event that you did with uh, uh, Professor Lee. Uh, talking about being, I think the title was the wrong kind of black intellectual, wrong kind of um, black thought leader. Um, that you, though she has a, a long career, I think forty years in DEI um, position. Uh, she was uh, ostracized and let go, and it, you know her experience and your experience seem to have a similar a tone to it. Why is it? It seems to me counterintuitive that areas of higher education universities where we're supposed to engage in, as they say, this transcendent experience of scholarship and, and learning, why would universities be a hotbed of this um, it was again, um, rigid race essentialism, meaning it's, as you say, it's anti-individual, it's anti-knowledge, it's anti-enlightenment. Um, why there, where in theory, that's their whole reason for being, is to impart these sort of um, uh, eternal values. They say you're, 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 if you're citing uh, uh, ancient Greeks, uh, that's you know tw 2,400 years ago. So they've had a good run. These ideas. Why is it, is that the center of 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 the problem? Uh, you mentioned the classics just now. Um, I think it's apropos because a lot of people are using education as a Trojan horse, right? <laughs> uh, for other for um, other ideas, these uh, cultural Marxism, social transformation and things like that. So all this is strategy, right? Race essentialism and the demonization of individuality is strategy. Um, calling standard English or the teaching of it to Black students inherently racist is a strategy. Saying that the very presence of white students and white professors, this is true, this is what uh, was said, um, is inherently racist. That that puts you know uh, one group against another, right? Which is the strategy, which is the point. Right. They know how nonsensical to be. Right. They know what they're saying makes no sense. They also know that a people are afraid to try to stop them. Right. Um, and they also know that B with this blunt force, they can get things done. Right. Um, that's the idea anyway. So so that's why it's happening in education. Yeah, I am um, again, I, I shared too many of my own stories, but, you know, you know, uh, for what it's worth, it, it's what piques my interest. I went to the Kennedy School, which is a professional you know, school of government where we we're going to, you know, in my yeah. mind, my, my undergrad was in engineering. So I'm like, OK, you know, we're going to get in a room. And even though I my views lean uh, more conservative and libertarian, you know, we're going to get the right answers, you know, de de independent yeah. of our preconceived notions. And we talk about all these uh, problems, uh, uh, poverty and uh, lack of education and crime and you know, and it seemed to me that um, the the observation in all cases when they did these studies is it, it, almost like a de facto obvious answer was the reason for all this is racism. And I say, okay, well, you also assert that racism is ubiquitous and everywhere and almost an immutable characteristic of human beings. It's it's in a sense unsolvable. Uh, so a, a, a problem without a solution isn't a problem. You have to move on. And let's say, okay, let's take racism off the board. What other factors can contribute to a uh, high prevalence of, of poverty, crime, or, or, or other things? Let's, let's, let's tackle something we can do. And I almost got these puzzled stares like, you know, we don't want to solve it. We just want to describe it. We just want to, you know, acknowledge it. But do you see this sort of almost like that, that these problems framing them in the way they are is almost making them impossible to solve because they don't want to solve them. Yes. You, 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 like uh, they, you're getting rid of a constituency. You're getting rid of the power you, to, to, to assert that you're, you're solving things. You know, I, I could go on a whole host of uh, programs that hurt the exact people they're designed to help, but one only needs to see the war in poverty isn't going well, that public schools in, in poor communities are terrible and people can't walk the street without getting fear of being hurt. Uh, you know, it, it, we could solve that tomorrow, but w because it's racism is the problem, we'll never solve it, right? Um, being hired to solve an unsolvable problem is a very lucrative job if you can get it, you know, <laughs> uh, because you are always needed. It's never going away. It can only be managed. 
it can only be contained, right? Um, I believe Kendi uh, proposed an idea for a branch of government on anti-racism. Now, clearly, this guy doesn't think racism will go away. Now, he says that subsequently later on. Um, but if you're going to create a department like that, you know, right. you, you don't really think it's going away or you don't want it to go away. If you're creating graduate programs, you can get a master's in DEI. And what's that person going to do if we solve racism in 10 years? They're going to go back to school, right? The idea is to perpetuate the racism. That's how you know it's a grift. I said this at the um, Cato event that you spoke of earlier uh, as well. I want to be as clear as possible about this. Uh, if you are if you are a DEI professional, an officer in academia, in HR, some corporation or something like that, if, if, if your job is to end racism, right? And you're not trying to make your job obsolete as quickly as possible, then you are enacting the very definition of a grift. That that is a grift, right? Um, even the some of the stuff I do, the idea is to if if racism, if race essentialism goes away, I'm going to change the mission, you know, of my projects. I'm going to change what I'm doing. I don't need to do that anymore. The goal is to not need to do this stuff anymore not to make a living out of it, right? right? DEI isn't a lifestyle, it's a job. We never make our way to this post-racial America that I hope we all aspire to. A lot of people are gonna be out of a job. So we, yeah. we can't, can't be there. So there's like, the, what is, I believe that Eric uh, Hoffer uh, quotation is every great cause begins as a movement then becomes a business. I think that's about where we are now. Yeah. And, uh, degenerates into a racket you know again i, I don't want to cast too too many aspersions on on perhaps well-intentioned field of study but um as you say uh if we solve these problems and I'll, I'll even put you know poverty and ignorance and all these things if we solve them if there's no more poor people then you know uh, a lot of people are uh, out of a job so um now i mentioned at the top of the show that you're you're on the vanguard of a you know a public intellectual movement there we know you know you mentioned a a few um, well-known um, uh, intellectuals who who uh, who let say pedal in, but promote uh, this anti-racism thought. Uh, obviously, uh, Ibram X. Kendi um, uh, and others. Um, you seem to be pushing back on that in a sense. I won't call you a pariah, but you're someone who uh, opposes the dominant narrative or as, as challenges the uh, dominant narrative. Uh, as such, you founded uh, an organization called Free Black Thought. Free Black Thought. I like the name. It's got black in there, so it maybe generalizes black, but it, I like the word free, so I can love that word and say, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to interpret free. Um, what does Free Black Thought, what is its reason for being, and what do you hope to, to do with this organization? Um, well, first of all, you can go ahead and call me a pariah. Uh, that's what I am. Uh, in my field at the moment. Uh, Free Black Thoughts is a group, a, a nonprofit uh, whose purpose is to display and illustrate and provide voices that prove viewpoint diversity within the Black collective. I don't like saying community because that is essentializing. In, in fact, um, the only reason we use the term Black is because we are where we are in society today. The goal is to get rid of black, right? But that's the goal. Like I was saying before, you know, uh, if my goal isn't to get rid of black and free black thought, then I'm a grifter, right? Bottom line. So right now we need the black, but later on, hopefully, uh, as soon as possible, we can live in a world where we don't need it. Um, but anyway, getting back to uh, free black thought, we have a journal of free black thought. Uh, we invite. Um, Black voices, typically the ones that aren't represented in mainstream media, uh, the opposites of Ibram X. Kendi, the opposites of uh, Robin D'Angelo and things like that. Um, and we're broadening, you know, um, we're, we're uh, you know, thinking about adding all kinds of different voices, right, viewpoint diversity. Um, so I get that. The reason why we only dealt with the non-represented Black voices is because they were non-represented. Um, in the beginning of what we were doing. Now we can broaden things a little bit and we'll see how that goes. 
Um, but that is the point. We also have a compendium, um, a, a uh, annotated bibliography of Black voices, right? Black writers, Black poets, Black artists, and things like that, who aren't abiding by the standard narrative that we know now, the victim narrative, the learned helplessness thing, right? Um, and with the idea that this can be used in education K through 12 um, to display viewpoint diversity within the Black collective. Uh, so that's the idea behind free Black thought. And we're only about three years old. Oh, good. Well, congratulations. I, I wanted, I, you kind of answered this already, but I'll just you know, ask it anyway, because I was curious about the, was, again, I love the word free. Uh, and I was more curious is, does free in that context mean free to have divergent thought, meaning come to us with whatever, you know, if it's good scholarship, we want to hear about it regardless of your, your worldview. Uh, so viewpoint freedom, uh, or is it more, let's say, um, free oriented as in terms of uh, individual oriented, or dare I say libertarian in its, in its orientation, as in there are no group rights, there are only individual rights, we all come to this world with a multitude and we are individual free people. Um, which is it, it? You don't have to pick one, but which which do you lean towards? Well, I'll say this first. Um, free Black thought is built on a foundation of classical liberalism, right? It's built on a foundation of the primacy of reason, civil society. Obviously, we, we got together and made an association, right? That's the whole point of that. Um, you know, um, primacy of reason, as I said already, individuality, spontaneous order, all these things are things that we abide by and we think are valuable to society. Getting rid of them would be a bad idea. Um, but getting back to free Black thought and the word free, um, that word serves as a verb and an adjective, right? It's the adjective, this, this, this thinking is free. Right. Um, this is a free kind of thinking. We don't have to abide by a particular narrative that was given to us. We don't have to abide by an ideology that was ready made um, that we're forced to, uh, you know, embrace. No, we can think freely. And it's also a verb, free black thought. You know, let those black voices who aren't being heard, give them a platform, you know, uh, give them a voice, give them a journal they can write it. Right. So it's it's uh, the word free is doing double duty there. It's a terrific, uh, one of my favorite words. Now, given that, um, as you say, you characterize yourself as a pariah, uh, one has to assume anyone who joins forces in free black thought may also be regarded as a, a, a pariah, given that they're, by your definition, unrepresented. If I'm an intellectual, I'm a, 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 a who happens to be black and, and is is inspired by your work and others in your organization. If I, in a sense, associate with my with you, and I'm in, let's say, academia. Aren't I committing uh, 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 professional suicide by, in a sense, um, acknowledging that we're you know, tr trapped in a, a, a culture of fear and and uh, we're having a um, an orthodoxy imposed on us that to to deviate to challenge uh, is somehow subversive uh, and 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 we should be shunned. Don't don't you worry that in a sense to join your group is to say goodbye to your academic career. Um, well, first and foremost, you talked about suicide, you know, um, you know, social academic death or something like that. The closest thing to immortality in academia is tenure. Um, so I have that. Um, other people have that so they can speak. I do not advise people who don't have it to speak. Um, they can contribute behind the scenes in, in, in various ways. Right. Um, but ultimately, I think the people who can speak, the people with tenure who have that job security have the duty to speak, especially if you don't like, you know, what's going on in contemporary anti-racism. In fact, if you don't like what's going on in contemporary anti-racism and you have tenure and you're saying nothing because you don't want the drama, you're part of the problem. You know, I know this is apocryphal, but um, apparently Dante was the one who said the um, hottest places in hell are reserved for the people who have the power to do something but don't, right? Th those are the worst kind of people. Um, I kind of, I, I like that statement because I, I kind of, uh, I agree with that sentiment. Anyway, um, so the people who have the ability to do something need to do something. And those other people need to just uh, help in whatever way they can. So um, beyond your free black thought uh, organization, there are other uh, wonderful um, uh, 
black thinkers uh, of the past and the present. Uh, you know, I we all know of, uh, you know the, the Frederick Douglasses of the world, but even you know in modern times, the, the Thomas Souls. I, I, I love Shelby Steele, uh, John McWhorter, all these great guys. Is there, um, let's say, a place uh, beyond free black thought where uh, these intellectuals or where if somebody is like, oh my gosh, you know, like please deliver some sanity. I want brilliant minds to, you know, address these issues for, as, as, as someone on the front lines. Where can listeners go to, in a sense, uh, find sanity in, 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 in you know, or, or at least an, an alternative to the dominant narrative uh, as far as you see? Well, there's always free black thought, you know, there's that. Um, but also there are other burgeoning, um, well, there's fire, there's fair, you know, these are places that are trying to, you know, um, well, fire is trying to save free speech, uh, very first amendment oriented uh, there. And fair is just trying to be fair, is trying to embrace what we think is true equality and not what's being called equality uh, today, which is really inequality because it's, you're, you're trying to favor one group over another. Um, there is also uh, a burgeoning consortium called the um, Institute of Liberal Values, which will incorporate um, organizations like Counterweight, um, Free Black Thought, um, uh, an organization called Empowered Pathways. These are all new things that are developing right now. The seeds have been planted. It is now a sapling. Hopefully it will grow into an oak as soon as possible. Um, so those are places, obviously, you can go, you know, to individual um, texts and things like that. There is the Glenn Laurie, John McWhorter, Thomas Chatterley, uh, Williams, uh, Ian Rowe in education, uh, Charles Love, Will Riley, um, Chloe, Chloe, Chloe Valerie, um, Camille Foster, Tabia Lee. You know, there are all these people out there who are saying these things and are making sense. Sheena Mason is another one. In fact, Sheena and, and uh, Dr. Lee, um, you know, they really abide by this idea of racelessness. The very concept of race, you know, is racism, right? Because by saying black and white, you're putting people into groups already, right? And you don't really need to do that. So what they want to do is what you said earlier, and what I hope happens eventually organically, they want to get rid of the the ubiquity of racial classification, right? Um, so all those people are out there um, and they're not hard to find. There are voices out there, black voices, people, black people pushing back against uh, this anti-racism. And I think they're saying good things. Yeah, we've had, we've had, uh, David, <coughs> I don't know if you bump into Mercado, but he uh, wrote a, a very profound book, I think, talking about we invented race to justify some of the horrible acts we were doing, meaning slavery had been sort of yeah. part of history. Uh, we had these founding principles that said all men are created equal. We've got these poor, awful chattel slaves. We have to invent something to justify that contradiction. Right. And we, right. uh, you know, let, let's let it go, right? It's the instrument of bad people, not good people. Um, but given, okay, so we're getting close to the end of our time together. Um, uh, you talked about some great leaders, but, you know, given the environment we work, we live in, we have a, a country of 330 million Americans. Everyone's got a phone. Everyone's on social media. Every given day, there's an opportunity to, to come up with some photograph or, of, of an event that, that encourages um, the narrative, right? If, if you want to see uh, instances of Black people being harmed by police or whatever given any day you, you know you can have a slow drip of you know horrible events um how do we in this environment you know i, I can mail someone a book but how do you combat um this slow drip of of sensational events i i i'll use this analogy for for my friends who uh who hated uh, after 9-11, the, the uh, anti-Muslim uh, sentiment. And then I shared their view that all Muslims, 2 million of them, are, uh, oh, 2 billion of them don't have our you know, demise as their, uh, you know, their motivating um, principle. But every time you said, I, you know, I don't think we have a problem with, with Muslims in America, they'd show another tape of the buildings falling down, 9-11, over and over and over. And it's like, what do you think now? I'm like, well, I still don't think you know, m Muslims are, are, are out to get us. Well, how about you know, take another look at that, Ben? I, I think uh, the event got... You know, it, it was a terrible event, but George Floyd was that moment it, sort of in this movement, which is to say, you know, 
it was a very bad policeman or a very bad police um, group, but it can't be representative of every police interaction. And yet, if you really are determined, you can come up with a narrative with endless examples. And there's still, you know, events that round to zero in, in, in statistics. So what do you do in, a, in, in the modern times to sort of breathe um, reality into sensationalism? Well, sensationalism happens. I mean, it's called social reality. Uh, and it's, so that, that social reality is allowed to uh, persist because there are so many things that can be taken out of context, right? And presented as the way things are as opposed to the way things were at that moment, right? Um, and, and that's easy to do, especially given the history of this world uh, or this of this country, right? Um, okay, uh, the cops are all racist. Well, given the fact that we had slavery and Jim Crow, it, it, it's, it's just not implausible that that's the case, right? So the probability, um, the narrative probability um, of these stories is what strengthens them. So what we have to do is create counter narratives and these counter narratives have to um, basically do the job of making classical liberal values cool again, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, we have to talk about these values in a way that is attractive, that people see how um, powerful they are, how beneficial they are, how empowering um, they are to one's individuality and one's life and one's fulfillment, one's overall happiness. We have to sell that again. Perhaps we need to be rhetorical in our discussions about classical liberalism, right? Um, and, and instead of just having these concepts be the, you know, things that hold up America, we should point them out. You know, we should point out the foundation, right? Uh, we should point out the uh, the buttresses, the uh, load bearing walls of our society, right? And say this is why this is valuable, right? Um, we should tell people that uh, you know race has been used to manipulate them. Uh, for several years, right, um, decades, we should remind people that there are 40 million individual Black people in this country. They can't possibly be the same in every aspect. Um, we need to recognize and understand the detriments of what is called the politics of pity, right, looking at Black people as this downtrodden group that always needs to be saved, right? That is not empowering, and, and it, it is not the kind of you know, a personality and outlook you want to embrace, not if you want to be happy in the world, right? So that's what we need to do. We need to create, you know, not a victim narrative, but a victor narrative. And that victor narrative has to be, you know, constituted by classical liberal values. That's what needs to happen. Indeed. Okay. Well, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Again, uh, again, as a sort of a, a conservatarian uh, a person who really is curious about this. I have to say, if you believe in markets or you believe in prosperity, making sure everyone is happy and, and educated and safe and prosperous benefits everyone. It's not a zero-sum game. It, there's no logic to um, promoting racism. It, it, it hurts everyone. Right. Uh, you know, so- Except for the DEI officers and the people who are, you know, using this for, you know, opportunistic reasons, yes. That's right. So, um, okay, we're at the end of our time for, uh, let's say, uh, group leaders or deans out there who say, look, you know, uh, I think we've gone down a dangerous path here. We need to, to have uh, some, um, uh, at least counterpoint to the, the dominant narrative on anti-racism. How, how um, would they go about it? Can, can a, a dean at my, my Kennedy School there, can, can he, uh, he call you up and say, we'd like you to speak to, in the forum and, uh, and, uh, and see what happens? Or yeah, I'd, have, I'd be happy to sit in the front row and see what happens, but I, uh, you know, how do we get from good ideas and podcasts to a uh, you know, broader acceptance and embrace of, of, of these ideas? Well, we build associations, we build networks of those associations. Um, there's power in numbers, and there's also comfort in numbers. Uh, they say pain shared is cut in half, right? So the, the frustration shared in dealing with uh, contemporary anti-racism is cut in half, um, you know, in, in a sense, if not more so, um, if you join with other like-minded people. Um, that dean inviting, for example, me, um, that could easily be shouted down or, or, or something like that. That being said, I'd love to do it, right? 
Um, you you said you want to be in a front row. I'm I would love to be on stage for that. I want to I want to you know I want to deal with that. Which is another thing we have to um, we have to not be afraid to push back, right? Um, I if I'm invited to Harvard to give a talk, I have to give that talk. I can't be like, no, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be chaos. No, I have to give it, right? And that kind of attitude is also important. And indeed, and I don't think there would be any problem. There's they, they still respect their guests at, at Harvard. Not everywhere, but none of that shit okay. happen. So I, I wouldn't know. I'm being uh, playful. Um, all right. Well, this has been a, a profound um, uh, and challenging uh, podcast episode for me. I, I don't pretend, pretend to understand um, much, but I do like what I read from you. And uh, uh, I think you're a breath of fresh air and you're doing, uh, you seem to be everywhere. So I, I had plenty to read and, and understand. Uh, I think you're a straight talker, and um, uh, at least whether someone agrees with you or not, you, they deserve to, to hear what you have to say. So I, I really appreciate you taking some time out of your day, out of your busy schedule to, to join us on Hubwonk. Thank you for being a part of this, Dr. Smith. Uh, thank you for having me. This has been another episode of Hubwonk. If you enjoyed today's show, there are several ways to support Hubwonk and Pioneer Institute. It would be easier for you and better for us if you subscribe to Hubwonk on your iTunes podcatcher. It would make it easier for others to find Hubwonk if you offer a five-star rating or a favorable review. We're, of course, grateful if you share Hubwonk with friends. If you have ideas or comments or suggestions for me about future episode topics, you're welcome to email me at hubwonk at pioneerinstitute.org. Please join me next week for a new episode of Hubwonk. <laughs>